Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Simon Mills. I'm a senior associate at the Zen Group, and I'd like to welcome you all to today's FS Club webinar, where we're going to be discussing nature as the next wave. I'm joined by two very distinguished speakers this morning, Simon Zadek, the Chair of Finance for Biodiversity and Senior Advisor to the Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disco Disclosure, as well as Dr. Vian Sharif, who heads sustainability at financial investment technology firm FNZ and is the founder of Nature Alpha. As always, the agenda for this webinar is very simple. Following my introduction, our speakers will make their presentation and then we'll move on to the Q&A discussion. Now, I'm afraid that you're all muted, but you are able to submit your questions to our speakers through the chat tool to the right hand side of your screen. Please do chip in at any point of the proceedings. I'm going to be collating your questions and I'll put them to our speakers at the end. As with all our FS Club webinars, we're going to be recording this session so you'll be able to access the slides and presentation at a later date. Now, before we move on, I really must thank FS Club members who've opened up our webinar series to the public. With their help since March of 2020, we've held over 300 of these events on topics as diverse as money laundering, the metaverse and high salinity agriculture. The FS Club are the premier global executive knowledge network for technology and finance, where members and their guests can meet over a glass of wine to debate key issues which impact on financial services, technology and society. It's very much like a 21st century version of the city's 17th century coffee houses. And so without, without further ado, I would like to introduce the first of today's speakers, Simon Zadek. Simon, tell us about nature as the next wave. Thanks, Simon. And many thanks also to ZDN and the FS Club members for inviting us to contribute to this. It is the next wave, and so we're certainly very excited to be involved in it. So I'm going to run through a few slides, then pass over to Vianne. But I'm really mainly looking forward to, as you put it, the coffee shop conversation to come. So slide, please. So I'm not going to, next slide, please. So I'm not going to spend much time on the state of nature. Um, I'm just going to kind of let you glare at this um, underlying contradiction in the way in which we are today. Um, many, many species and different aspects of nature in decay, um, potential for collapse in multiple ways, links across to social unrest uh, and obviously also the climate agenda. And yet we are 100% dependent on nature for our global $90 trillion a year GDP. Uh, and so really what this session about is about is sort of how to fix this picture in a way that makes more sense. Next slide, please. So just so we're clear what numbers we're talking about, um, 25 years of so-called conservation finance tends to lead one to think about that little dot on the left-hand side. You know, how much money can we raise to invest in protecting nature? And whilst that should in no way be dismissed, it of course is not really the core of the challenge and the opportunity facing us. Uh, that what we're really trying to do, as with climate, is to align global financial flows, so public and private, although only private is depicted here, um, with, let's call it nature positive outcomes, you know, which is the equivalent of net zero in the carbon space. So we're talking really across all global financial flows, although obviously Today, we'll limit ourselves to some specific examples. Next slide, please. And just to illustrate that this is not just a matter of the volume of finance, but has as much to do with the way in which finance and economy and nature have become, if you like, 
an embedded vicious circle in the way in which they dynamically connect to each other. Uh, here you have the example of food. If you like, food is to nature as energy is to carbon. So food in a way is the critical $8 trillion a year sector that we need to think about first and foremost when we think about nature-related challenges, so broadly land use and oceans. And here you can see without going into the details, a kind of simplified version of how a cheap food policy leads to you know, further degradation of nature, leads to a lock-in of financial actors with vested interests in maintaining that high volume, cheap stuff, low protein, uh, and a whole series of effects that it has on the way in which commodity markets and other parts of the global financial system and real economy really function. Obviously a simplification, but simply to emphasize the point, this is not just about mobilizing more money. Uh, this is about unwrapping the way in which our global economy has become embedded in an approach uh, that leads to extraction from nature and the overall deterioration of nature over time. Next slide, please. There we go. And then just switching briefly into a simplified finance for biodiversity lens. Finance for biodiversity perhaps set up um, first and foremost because materiality of nature doesn't count effectively in financial decision making. So if you like that market failure, which I'm sure we'll come back to in discussion. And, and really just this slide pointing to the many different variables that affect materiality of nature in financial decision making from anti-money laundering rules to the availability of data to measure to the communication to financial markets um, to the way in which stimulus has been over the last two years, further degradating of nature uh, and so on. So really trying to highlight that there are many different pieces to this story. Uh, we put down the left-hand side, some of the strategic lenses that Finance for Biodiversity pursues, but certainly those are not the only ways of thinking about this topic, but you can see you know, data metrics very much in the market efficiency space, enhanced liability, anti-money laundering rules, and so on, citizen engagement as consumers, as campaigners, as voters, and so on. Obviously, public finance, 35, 36% of global expenditure every year. Nature markets, so biodiversity credit markets, and other ways in which new nature markets are beginning to emerge. And then all the cross-cutting issues that really connect the different pieces of this mosaic together. So a lot to be done and also a lot ongoing. Next slide, please. And, and really just to point out a couple of the things that are going on, uh, and I know VM will come back in particular to the data metrics side, so I won't dwell too long on that. So, so this is, if you like, a lens on a micro fraction uh, of the things that are going on in trying to place nature um, in financial markets through a classical risk lens. The Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosure, TNFD, much like TCFD, perhaps broader, more complicated, six years on from when TCFD started, really trying to get a, a broader set of variables about the way in which natural capital is impacted, the way economic assets are dependent on natural capital and so on. But, but that's an important, but only one piece of the broader story, bankrolling extinction, one of a growing number of campaigns against the financial community, much like we saw beginning to emerge around climate four, five, six years ago, beginning to point out really what relationship the financial community has with natural capital for better, or in the case of public campaigning, often for worse, perhaps less obvious to some, but certainly uh, a rising star in the legal liability space, um, a niche of how one, if you like, affords legal rights of personhood on nature, starting in Brazil and Ecuador, now in New Zealand and elsewhere, perhaps 
a new legal paradigm beginning to emerge, which obviously will infect, affect insurance markets and many other parts of the financial community. Over there on the top right-hand side, uh, as I mentioned before, a growing amount of work looking at the application of anti-money laundering rules um, to a broader range of nature crimes and wildlife, which is where it has principally been applied uh, in the past. So all kinds of different things going on. And then if we flip the slide on one more, likewise, it's important to move from a risk lens to an opportunity lens. Ultimately, you know, we do price risk, of course, in the financial community, but what we're ultimately trying to figure out is where those opportunities are. And we're beginning to see a whole array of different ways in which nature can be more effectively monetized, can be profitable, and therefore can be subject to reasonable investment strategies and broader financing approaches. Just to draw one or two examples from what's there, the ecosystem services provided by mangroves, obviously we see this critical relationship between voluntary carbon markets and so-called nature-based solutions, an estimated 40% of carbon offsets from voluntary carbon markets uh, are projected to be derived from nature assets. Uh, but we also see a next generation of broader biodiversity credit markets beginning to arise in water, in soil, and elsewhere. Um, perhaps at the other end of the story, uh, top right, uh, a little less clear to distinguish, the famous Ant, Ant Forest app, uh, 600 million Chinese people using the equivalent of PayPal, so Alipay, uh, with an app that delivers information about one's climate and nature footprint as a result of one's expenditure patterns, gamified, driven into your social media, award system attached to it, all trying to push consumers towards more interesting approaches to dealing with nature and climate related impacts of their consumption patterns. Uh, sitting in the middle there, Intrinsic Exchange Group, one of a whole group range of different initiatives that are trying to take this complicated set of factors that transform land into something more sustainable, nature positive, new revenue streams, all sorts of different bits and pieces that are in a standard form unmanageable in capital markets. Intrinsic Exchange Group, one of the organizations that's trying to put a corporate wrap around the way that complex mosaic of activities are happening on the ground, begin to commoditize them, standardize them, allow them to be risked appropriately, and therefore become much more interesting to capital markets. Intrinsic, particularly interesting because of their relationship with the New York Stock Exchange, but many other actors also beginning to build similar approaches to take complicated nature and find ways in which it can make sense in capital markets going forward. Next slide, please. And, and so really just to sort of conclude this brief opening, um, you know, what has one got to do? Well, VM will also help us think about that a little bit and in discussion as well. I put down kind of four really self-evident obvious things to be done, uh, each of which obviously has to be unpacked into greater complexity. But first of all, you just got to understand it better. We've discovered in the climate space, you can't just a annex, um, prefix the word climate to finance and think that you've got the job done. You really got to understand, not become a PhD scientist, uh, but at least get a basic understanding of how nature and the economy interact. Secondly, low hanging fruit, the sort of risks and dependency side, whether it be in relation to disclosure or in relation to the way in which you're driving asset valuation as a financial institution. Thirdly, a far wider array of policy and regulatory developments than we've seen in the climate space. Not surprisingly, because of course, environmental regulation in many different forms has existed uh, for decades, if not a century and more. So one's got to understand what the policy and regulatory space looks like, both as it relates to nature per se, but also such as in the case of AML rules, as it relates to the way in which financial regulation runs. And, and then last but not least, those opportunities. This sort of myth that perhaps VN and Simon in discussion we can come back to, that you can't monetize nature or there are very limited opportunities to do that. That myth becoming more and more apparent, but we're still at an early stage where those opportunities are underpriced 
first mover advantages are there. With that, Simon, I'll pass back to you. Uh, thanks very much indeed. Fantastic. Vianne, uh, can we hear from you, please? Absolutely. And thank you again uh, so much for this opportunity to be in this forum with your members. Uh, really exciting to have this debate together. So um, just a brief introduction to say that when I arrived uh, a, a few years back work and started working with mainstream environmental social governance data that was being used uh, to run some $50 trillion worth of investment assets. I was really shocked, having been a conservationist, but also worked in investment management for the previous decade, that there seemed to be a hole in this data for nature. Um, and so for me, what was interesting was to see how this space then evolved. And what we've really started to see is a, a tremendous acceleration, not only in the awareness that there is something we need to address when it comes to nature degradation and that finance is one way to be able to achieve positive change but also in the acceleration of the sorts of frameworks the sort of data that we have available and the sorts of uh, regulation that are coming into play so really we know that creating appropriate frameworks to collect measure and report on nature related data is the next step in helping us make the right investment decisions moving forward if we are to decide that we need to maintain the integrity of the environmental systems which are the foundation of the world as we know it this ecosystem we have is what we have to underpin our way of life the food that we eat the the, the products that we manufacture we need to start thinking about doing things differently and it's interesting to understand the role of finance in this but as it stands, there is a perceived gap between financial institutions, requirements of companies when it comes to reporting this nature data. And you've seen that in the gap that we've seen in ESG data. Also, it is interesting to understand that there's a, 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 a level of understanding that financial institutions now need to uh, upskill. They need to bring that information in house. And let's move to the next slide, if we can, Peter. Outlining here some of the challenges that we hear from financial institutions. So a lack of credible insights at the asset level. How do we really understand the impact of a company on nature, this system? There's also a question around, look, we just don't have enough data. There's just not anything out there that we, we feel can give us a comprehensive enough picture of the sorts of things that we need to know to measure our risks over time. And then finally, we often hear that the system is just too complex to understand at scale. Yes, nature is a very complex system. It's an ecosystem that has many variables. But actually, what is interesting is that I believe we're at the nexus of three critical changes. And that this moment represents a very interesting opportunity for the firms who want to take a stand to capture an opportunity when it comes to uh, the value that we're now putting into or understanding that nature brings to us. So first, our awareness of the impact of, the of our impact on the environment is being catalyzed globally. It's unusual for people not to understand that there's something going on in our environment now. We hear it all the time. We hear it through the news. We hear it in terms of the, uh, in terms of the uh, landscape that we're now inhabiting. But secondly, what's interesting now is that regulators are acting and business is taking note. So anything from the Article 29 regulation in France, which mandates companies or finance institutions to report on their nature-related impact, through to the EU taxonomy, through to the evolving TNFD, the Task Force for Nature-Related Disclosures, through to the EU Sustainable Finance Disclosure Review. This is regulation that's coming into play and businesses are taking note. But finally, the role of technology in harnessing and processing the insights that we need to inform decision making is unprecedented. And so, Peter, if we could move to the next slide. Thank you. As Al Gore says, we are entering an age of radical transparency. And that's not just because you can start to see and monitor around the world what's going on on social media in terms of what companies are actually doing. Instead of asking what data we don't 
have. Actually, we could look at the data that we do have and look, there's a range of it out there that we can build upon. So not only do we have geospatial insights in the form of understanding what is going on in terms of companies' proximity to certain areas, certain key protected areas, areas of rich biodiversity, areas of highly prized biodiversity um, richness. But we also have satellite data, which can help us understand land use change over time, tree cover loss over time, water stress over time, where watersheds are. Then we have company location data, which is increasingly becoming something that's available. We have reputational signals. We have the established frameworks and data sets that scientific organizations and NGOs have been building for years. And these are really uh, these are shared assets that we're standing on the shoulders of giants in using the likes of IUCN, IBAT, IUCN, etc. We have a history of understanding climate scenarios and how to model those. We understand that there are multiple aspects of natural capital. It's not just biodiversity, but it's how that system interlinks. But it's also how are companies managing their identified risks. This is something that shareholders have been asking for a very long time. Where are your material risks and how can we model that into the future to give us a better understanding of how we might tackle these issues? Should we set targets? Should we look at mitigating our impact? Should we do environmental assessments? How should we behave as a company to manage the risks that we might have moving forward? And then we have machine learning and other new technologies which can help us bring these data sets together fill in the gaps and create more data than ever before. That is useful. Let's move to the next slide, Peter. Thank you. Really, instead of saying what we don't have, we're confident that actually there are many aspects, many lenses on these, this picture that will enable us to build frameworks to enable a first step of understanding a company's impact or business's impact on the natural world. And these are just some of them. Impacts, dependencies, we can look at Encore for these things. We can look at international frameworks and how sectors are impacting on those frameworks. The food sector is a case in point, mining, etc. Then we can look at what's going on in the supply chain of these companies. We can understand what actually these companies are doing. Are they doing what they say they're doing? How is that affecting their share price? What are they leaving on the table? What's unmanaged and what do they need to look out for? And then of course we can use this rich, this rich data pool of geospatial insights of all the satellite data that we have that change over time to actually start to look at how is a company impacting the environment around it in real time. And that gives us a nice range of data points that we can start with. Let's move ahead, Peter. So really what we're positing here is that any financial institution using the tools available in a framework that is user friendly, and that is important, we have to curate these data sources and help to put them into a format where a biodiversity expert doesn't need to be doing this. You know, how many of us, when we're doing our own taxes, go to an accountant to help us through this? This is inevitably going to need some help at the start of this journey. But nevertheless, any financial institution using the tools we have available to us today will be able to make the evolution from climate to nature and counting supported by the guidance that is in the market today, including some of the amazing work that Finance for Biodiversity is doing and including the awareness that the Task Force for Nature Markets, the Task Force for Nature Related Disclosures and, and um, associated frameworks are doing in this space. Thank you. And back to you, uh, Simon, for our session, the remainder of the session. Well, that was an absolutely fascinating can canter through a, a really complex and vital issue. I can see we have a great deal of questions from our audience, but as the, the chairman, I got the privilege of asking the first one. Uh, and this is really around the, the tragedy of the commons. Markets can be an extremely effective mechanism for providing the goods and services that society needs. However, they're much less effective at dealing with public goods, such as flood prevention, climate change, or the preservation of biodiversity. How can we close this gap? Um, Simon, perhaps if I may reflect uh, initially, it was very interesting to see exactly this question be reflected in some of the recent uh, 
frameworks and publications that have been put into the market. I refer some of our, our listeners to things like the Dasgupta Review, where it's exactly this question. You know, it's not $44 trillion worth of our economy that is dependent or highly dependent on nature. As Simon Zadek said, it's actually 100%. So how do we start to do this? And one one way of doing this, as has been recognized by policymakers, as has been recognized in the systemic risk that is posed to nature degrega degradation, is to mainstream these considerations and not only to think of natural capital or uh, investing in natural capital or natural, um, uh, natural capital assets as a thing by itself, but more to understand that businesses in their day-to-day activities in measuring their impact in mitigating risk from those impacts can actually realize value in themselves and for their shareholders and stakeholders through understanding their own nature related risks and opportunities i don't know if you'd like to reflect on that simon yeah, i'll start at the other end um uh so you know we we don't think people should die when they work and so we protect them with something called laws yeah and that shouldn't be ignored in the same way that we you know as a global community agree that slavery is really not on and so we make it illegal and we put people in jail as often as possible when they transgress now i say that other simon um not because that's the only solution but because Markets exist as socialist phenomena that they create in society in order to trade because trading can be a hugely effective way of generating wealth and distributing that wealth. Um, and of course, they're subject to the rules of the game. But, but then just to expand on that just for a second, of course, we have a wide range of types of markets as they relate to public goods. You know, pencil sharpeners, um, although I'm sure somebody will tell me something different, you know, are not subject to a lot of rules that pertain to public goods issue beyond ensuring that people don't get their finger stuck in it and hurt. You know, so actually public goods rules do exist for pencil sharpeners too. And, and then all the way through the financial sector, the pharmaceutical sector, the most recent outcrop of voluntary carbon markets, all of these are looked at through a combined lens of public good and private gain uh, and we try to advance rules of the game that allow for private gain uh, and yet are very conscious of the public good issues that they involve that that's not a formula it's a sort of reflection on the history of trying to develop markets that are vibrant are liquid uh, can deliver products that we all want into the future and yet um, are seeking to manage some of the unintended consequences. And then my last point, of course, would be, you know, coming back to that first slide, you know, you know, millions of species at risk, even although nature and species included, therefore, you know, are utterly the core of our global economy. We clearly haven't done this very well in the past. Um, you know, we, it's, otherwise we wouldn't be having this conversation today. And so, Public goods as they relate to nature damage are not well managed and are not well regulated. Uh, and that's part of why this more recent wave, partly triggered and powered by the kinds of data innovations that VN has talked about, is both really exciting, provides plentiful opportunities, but is also really important through a nature preservation lens. I think what many people struggle with is the monetization of of uh, of, of, of public goods. So, for example, uh, a farmer um, upstream in a catchment area may gain financial benefit by cutting down the trees on his land. The people who live in the city will be the people who suffer from increased flood risk and vice versa if the farmer plants trees on his land or manages his land for biodiversity the the risk to people downstream from flooding may decrease but how do you actually um make that link between the receivers of the the downstream benefit and the people who are actually investing upstream think of it um not as a socratic challenge but as a design problem yeah and then one really sees what the task force on nature markets for example that vn referred to is all about 
how does one design markets that trade nature in ways that deliver nature positive equitable outcomes yeah now that may seem to some who are deep in financial markets to be the wrong way round to thinking about markets you know we develop markets because there are trading opportunities yeah and then eventually the regulators get involved and figure out that there need to be some rules of the road but but actually we also develop markets with public goods in mind voluntary carbon markets as a case in point biodiversity credit markets now beginning to emerge around the world is another case in point the water trader mar trading markets in australia fit precisely what you're describing which is you know if everybody had the right to draw on water upstream on their land leaving absolutely nothing downstream for other farmers what's the future of agriculture in australia and what's the future of those different communities that are all dependent on water so we see markets evolving with governance mechanisms sometimes digitally enabled that are increasingly trying to balance the need for product and service the the need to ensure that the underlying asset in this case nature is sustained and and also frankly the need to ensure that there is some reasonable distribution uh, of benefits and and so i understand and agree simon that these are the challenges that are facing us in many respects but if we think of them as design challenges rather than endemic or pervasive or unavoidable problems that we simply can't deal with, then we begin to develop the kinds of nature markets that we need. Uh, I've got a very interesting question here from one of our audience members. How can you monetize nature without redesigning money? I'll give it a first shot. Um, I think that's a... <laughs> And then yeah, Vianne, you can and I'll have a second um, shot. I'll give the trivial answer and Vianne can give the um, the deeper <laughs> answers. I don't know what the person who asked the question is wearing, but I'll let you know that 100% of it is derived from nature. So, so the underlying question of, you know, can we monetize nature without monetizing, without reinventing money, of course, is answered by the fact that the person is not naked. Yeah, that they're wearing nature, they're eating nature, they're traveling on nature, all of which is monetized. But, but maybe the person is asking a slightly different question, which is how can we monetize nature and ensure positive nature outcomes? And for that, do we need to reinvent money? And, and there, I would lean more towards many of the interesting experiments that are beginning to emerge in the blockchain tokenization NFT space which are exactly seeking to drive tokenization, i.e. new forms of money um, that embed at an accountability, traceability, transparency level, the characteristics of preserving nature throughout the trading value chain. So I would say to the person, assuming that they are dressed, yeah, all nature can be monetized and is, much of it or some of it perhaps shouldn't be, and he's absolutely or she's absolutely right. We do need to really rethink how money reflects nature positive equitable outcomes, not only the short term trading value of a product or service. The end. Over to you. Simon, thank you. And I, I think that's such a fascinating question. And the way that immediately came to my mind of how we might frame one lens on this is let's look at shareholder value or, or stakeholder value being realized by companies who companies who are embracing environmental social governance considerations just as a, as a proxy for let's say embracing uh, the the understanding of nature risks and opportunities and if we look to that because now we're we're finally in a place where we can gather meaningful data not only do you have the big four accountancies looking at companies who want to IPO with ESG as a key pillar of the of what's going to drive your valuation. So sometimes generating between two and five times the multiple, you're know, adding two to five percent of the times the multiple that you would have had if you had good ESG considerations. You would you would generate more. Not only do you see a correlation between companies that perform well on ESG considerations and higher performance and therefore generating uh, more positive returns, generating more wealth, et cetera. But you also th see things like better top line growth. You see cost reductions because there are fewer things that you have to deal with in terms of crises. You're more efficient if you're managing your risks in this way. 
there are fewer regulatory and legal considerations if you're adapting to transitions that the regulator's putting out there. You have productivity because you have a, a workforce who's gathering around a purpose. They believe in what they're doing. They're delivering something that isn't just generating pure profit, but is generating something that is productive and meaningful. And that's what people want to do generally. They need purpose. They want purpose. They want to do meaningful work. But also your 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 maximizing an investor looking at a company like this is maximizing its investment it's looking at where am i going to put my money today so that the company that i'm investing in is going to do well in the future and so all of these factors are actually generating value and for me there's a parallel here around how you i'm not sure it's about reinventing money but maybe it's about reinventing value and this consideration around how companies who behave well and consider their impact on nature and manage that impact responsibly can actually generate value for the future. So just a different take on the question. Um, that's absolutely fascinating. I, I think, you know, the, 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 the writing's definitely on the wall. Um, this session's called Nature as the Next Wave. But why should markets move now when it's just a ripple? Is there first mover advantage for, for starting to take steps in this space? Go for Simon, it, Leanne. Do, do you want to? I'm sorry, I'm not hearing you, Simon, for some reason. Oh dear, sorry. Uh, the, my, my question Carry was, on, is, there a, is there a first a, mover a, advantage so to, to taking this steps out. in this space? Okay, I'll kick off. Uh, Vian, the question is, you know, um, why should market actors move early? Why, why don't they wait until all those policies and regulations and everything are in place and there are mature markets and so on? And so I'll give a first hit and then Vian, pass to you. Um, so, so firstly, the truth is, you know, is that most folks in the market are not first mover advantage types. You know, the market is full of followers and even more full of laggards. Yeah, and so, you know, it's almost a contradiction in terms to imagine that 100% of the market moves first. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah, it's the same with a small number of people buying fair traded coffee or buying Tesla motor cars. Um, it's always a few percent that drives the market forward and then the avalanche comes behind that. Uh, and so that's a sort of general observation, but perhaps Simon, that wasn't quite what you were asking. So let me kind of drill down one part more and then hand it off to the end. Um, I think we are seeing first movers, but it may not look like it's about nature or even about climate. And, and so let me give you a couple of examples to make the point. You know, we're seeing in the food sector significant innovation in the alternative protein and vertical farming space. Why? Well, of course, in the alternative protein space, it has on the surface an awful lot to do with the perceived increased costs associated with climate change, whether it be policy imposed or physical. And at the same time, it has an awful lot to do with um, increased action around nature to reduce nature crime and the ability of cattle rearing, for example, in Brazil, to benefit from low-cost ecosystem services associated with nature crime. In the vertical farming space, similarly, there are significant reductions in carbon emissions associated with next-gen vertical farming. But what's interesting, of course, is that the impact on nature, the nature footprint of vertical farming, by any measure is radically reduced. And if you broaden nature to, to include air and water, for example, you'll see with vertical farming, you have a 90, 95% reduction in the use of water compared to soiled agricultural techniques. My point is not to advertise alternative protein and vertical farming, but to point out that early movers don't necessarily move yapping on about nature and or climate. They're moving because they can see new opportunities emerging um, that in and of themselves are beginning to squeeze into existing markets that are still extractive of nature, just like fossil fuels vis-a-vis -vis renewables, that they see in the future that as nature becomes increasingly costed and protected, 
as climate change becomes increasingly costed, um, those sorts of technology-driven innovations will be increasingly profitable to them and others. So I would argue most folks aren't first movers, but we're already seeing first movers acting around nature issues, and we will see it in more and more areas moving forward. The end. I'm, I'm assuming that the question is about first movers and, uh, and maybe just furnish me with a little bit more Simon Mills, if you'd like. Now I can't hear you, Simon. I've muted myself, that's why you couldn't hear me. Uh, oh, why yeah. should companies move now? Is there a first mover advantage? Mm. I, we can see just as with climate change, so finally seen the SEC now start to talk about disclosure, you've got mandatory disclosures in the UK on TCFD, the Task Force Climate Related Disclosures, New Zealand the same, increasingly what's coming through in the EU, very, very specific about what one is disclosing. My view, and this reminds me of Simon's first slide, there's a tidal wave coming. The question is when are companies going to accept that and, and taking a first step on that journey would seem to be a prudent and reasonable thing to do in the face of a tidal wave, but also could offer, as Simon suggested, the opportunity to participate in an opportunity where, and as any investor, you get it early to capture the growth that is coming. And I, I think that you, that is increasingly on the table. And my view is that if companies don't, or certainly if investors don't consider this today, they will be leaving money on the table. And so you're seeing increasingly, what I imagine will happen is that nature insights and nature risk insights will become mainstreamed into ESG data or ESG metrics. It will become another factor that investors are considering. And you've got some of the largest firms in the world, including the likes of BlackRock, saying that growth in just one sector of ESG funds, ETFs, is going to grow to something like $400 billion worth from a sing, you know, single to early double digits today over the next decade. This is an opportunity that's going to happen. The question is, how much growth do people want to capture? And could they begin the journey uh, today, which will enable them to do so? Ah, now this is a fascinating question. What would financial professionals like academics to research? What research still needs to be done? Oh, Simon, do you want to take that? Or should I give a bit of experience? Take it first. It's a fascinating question because I've spent uh, probably the last five to eight years working between finance and academia. So working with scientists at Oxford and Cambridge and other institutions alongside the finance community to help bridge this gap. Um, and I think there absolutely is a place for academic insight to underpin the rigor of the metrics that we will be using to, to shape the future trajectory of our world. So in the first place I went to to understand how you could start to devise frameworks was, was my PhD supervisor, because if we don't use the science, if we don't have a rigorous scientific underpinning to what we're doing, then how can we possibly achieve the right outcomes in the future? Simon, you might have another view. <laughs> yeah, so Finance for Biodiversity works with the National Environment Research Council in the UK, in fact, in making awards to UK academics who research in this area. Uh, and so, first of all, that's part of the answer in that we think there's a critical role for the academic community, but perhaps an academic community that is less stepping back and waiting for historic data and more stepping forward and engaging in real-time experimentation, which is not suitable for all academics, as we know. What are the areas where work is needed? Well, there are many, but I'll mention two or three. One is we need new governance approaches to nature markets um, and to the way in which nature 
is trafficked across existing markets in the global economy. And there's a lot of work that isn't only looking at, you know, should there be a law on this or a policy on that, but also, for example, the role of digitally based uh, governance innovations. And we've talked about blockchain, there are also many others at play. So governance would be one role. Secondly, there is a whole lot of work going on now, but still more to be done in whether or not a new generation of biodiversity credit markets are going to be are, are going to emerge. Now in the UK, we already have, if you like, point-to-point -point biodiversity offsets. So you made a mess there, so you do something there. But can we imagine more broadly biodiversity credit markets with liquid secondary markets? And I think that you know, raises lots and lots of metrics issues, so lots of work for VN and others to do. Um, but there's a lot of research that's already ongoing. Uh, and so there are multiple areas where research is needed to both understand what's already going on and to begin to invent some of the future frameworks and standards and approaches to enable nature to be traded more effectively and with those public goods that you described at the beginning, Simon, firmly in mind. Could I just want Thank make you one very further much, Simon. Uh, Vianna, I'm further afraid further that further? time has caught up with us. Uh, and I know that we've still got quite a few outstanding questions from our audience. We will email them to our speakers who will be able to, to contact you directly. Uh, I do apologise for those of you that we didn't get to. Um, we're going to be posting a recording of this presentation online in the next couple of days so you can revisit today's discussion. It just remains for me to thank members of the FS Club for making today possible. I would also urge you to keep an eye on our forthcoming events page for more webinars which are going to include um, what have we got coming up? Global security challenges, the launch of the Global Green Finance Index, uh, more uncertainties in life and how they'll impact financial services, and can a good standard for governance make a difference? The case for ISO 37000. Uh, thank you very much for listening. I do hope you'll join us again soon. And also thanks to you, Simon, on behalf of both of us. Thank you.